If you were to look at your day-to-day -day life, you know, your daily life, would you say that you're in control of it? You know, the day by day, the, the every day you wake up and you do whatever you're going to do and then you go to your next week. Would you say that you're in control of your life or would you say that there are lots of things in your life that feel outside of your control? Um, with this in mind, Heather and I uh, just this week have been planning Christmas. Uh, we're filming this in the middle of November and we sat down this week to begin to plan what Christmas might, might look like for us. And we're putting things in the calendar and we're saying, yeah, we'll go here then and we'll do this then. And we've got two children. We've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old. So during Christmas, we've got this two-week period where both of our kids will be at home. So we're like, how are we going to spend their time? What's it going to look like? And for us, we're thinking... There's lots that is going to be outside of our control, right? Stuff's just going to happen and uh, we're just going to have to go with it. And there's obligations, you know, who are we hosting? When are we hosting? When are we going to see certain people and all this kind of thing? And there's stuff in there that we're like, no, we can control this. You know, we're going to, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we, uh, you know, enjoying it, but making these plans and recognising that sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes Christmas can feel like this kind of cloud of chaos that is kind of encroaching on your life. And it is coming whether you like it or not. And you're thinking, what am I going to do here? So, uh, yes, ask the question, do you feel in control of your life on a day by day basis or not? Well, how about the future? Well, why don't you take a step back and look at the big picture side of your life? Do you feel in control of your life in general, of where your future might lay and what you might be doing in the future and the big picture side of stuff? What about from a faith perspective? Would you say that God is in control of everything? Or do you, would you say in the other end of the spectrum is God not in control of anything? I'd be interested to know what your sort of thoughts are as you ponder this idea. Or do you sit somewhere in the middle when it comes to what God's in control of and what he's not in control of? I quite enjoy pondering this kind of stuff. And today what we're going to do is we're going to explore this idea of control. What are we in control of? and what is outside of our control, and what does God control, and all this kind of thing. We're going to explore this today through an Old Testament story. Uh, there's this Old Testament story in a book called Daniel, uh, written after a guy called Daniel. And the story follows Daniel, but it also follows three other guys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Maybe you haven't heard of those names before, but maybe you've heard of the names that they were then given, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're going to explore this story together. We're going to work through this story together. And uh, we're going to explore this idea and concept of control. What do we control? What does God control? And how does that work for our lives? So if you've got a Bible with you, why not open it on your phone? Or if it's a paper one, open it to the book of Daniel. As I said, it's in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible. We're going to be looking at the, three, the first three chapters of Daniel today. But before we jump into the story, let me give you a little bit of context as to sort of the, the background behind this story. You see, Israel was this nation at the time was split into two bits. There was the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. And the, uh, the empire of the Babylons, the Babylonian empire, came and sieged Israel. They invaded Jerusalem and they took a load of the kind of precious treasures from the temple in Jerusalem. And the people were thrown into what we call exile. They were exiles from their own country under the rule of Babylon. Now, the Babylonian Empire at the time was led by this king called Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, to summarise who Nebuchadnezzar was, in short, he was an absolute nightmare. And, and we'll find out more about him as we get into the story. But here Israel are, the people of Israel are in exile. And the king uh, comes up with a bit of an idea to sort of provide himself with more support. We're going to read it from the first chapter of Daniel from verse 3. It says this. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, king of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king then assigned them a daily amount of food and wine to be brought from the king's table. And they were to be trained there for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Now, among those chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, 
Mishael and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, Daniel, Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Okay, so here's the beginning of this story. We're going to rather than refer to them in their old names. We're going to refer to them as the names we tend to remember them by, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And here they are. They're being trained by the king for three years um, to, in order to then be under his service. Now, we're looking at this idea of control and what are we in control of and we are, what are we out of control of. The first thing that I want to raise to us and bring to us today is this reality that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and Daniel were all born into privilege, weren't they? It says here the king was looking for certain people. He was looking for people who were either part of the royal family or people who were born of the nobility, as it were. Young men without physical defect, those who were handsome, aptitude for every kind of learning. It's clear to see here that these men were born into privilege. That is something that they could not control. You can't control where you were born, can you? You can't control the circumstances that you have been brought up in. You can't control your upbringing. I don't know about you. What were the circumstances that you were born into? And how do you feel about that? But maybe you were born into a circumstance that was hard. Maybe there was a lot of lack in your upbringing. And maybe you're carrying certain feelings about that. Maybe, maybe you're feeling bitter about that. Maybe you're feeling angry about what was before, the way you were brought up or what you were born into. Or maybe the other side of things, maybe you were born into privilege. Now, there are different stresses and different anxieties that come with either of these things. Maybe for somebody who was born into privilege, maybe you feel guilt and shame around what you were brought into. Heather and I recently went to a wedding and uh, it was in this massive like manor, like, you know, listed building, you know, huge place with huge loads of grounds. And it's beautiful. And we just presumed that uh, this was hired. But it turns out the groom was actually raised in this house. It was owned by the groom's family. We're like, my goodness, look at this. His reception took place in their front hallway. It was that big, right? Anyway, he gets up for his speech and... and I can't, you know, quote him word for word, but in his speech, he came across like actually he felt guilty about being brought up in privilege. It was fascinating having not particularly myself being brought up in nobility or part of the royal family or anything like that or growing up in a big house like that. I was like, wow, this guy feels guilt and shame almost around his privilege. The reality of however we've been raised, however we've been brought up is that we can't change it. We are totally out of control of the circumstances that we were born into. It's not something that we have the ability to go back and change. And let's actually widen it up. It's not just about what we're born into and our upbringing, but everything that has happened in the past up till this moment right now, we are out of control of. Maybe once we were in control of it, but now as we look back at it, and as you look back at the things that have happened in your past, it's not within our control. And that's something that is important for us to face as we explore this idea of, well, what are we in control of? And what does God control? And, and all this kind of stuff. We have to start by acknowledging, before we look at the present, before we look at the future, acknowledging that we can't change and we can't control what has come before. So let's go back to the story, shall we? So these men were chosen. And uh, Daniel, right at the beginning of this time, he goes up to the king's court official and he says, hey, I hear that you're going to provide us with this food and wine from the king's table that we're supposed to eat. But Daniel saw this food and this wine and he says, actually, this is unclean for us to eat. So Daniel then asks the guard to not eat the king's food. But he says, hey, can I just eat vegetables and drink water? Now, at first they say no, but he gets into a bit of a negotiation. He says to them, give me 10 days and I will prove that I will be healthy in 10 days through doing it. And he proves it. So he's allowed to do it. Now, what's fascinating here is that considering the circumstances that the Israelites were in, considering the circumstances that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel were in, so much of that was outside of their control, right? Here they are, exiles, out of their own country, not in their own place, being ruled by somebody they don't want to be ruled by, having to then serve somebody they don't really want to serve, having to go through three years of training that they probably don't want to do. 
So much of that is outside of their control. But Daniel in this moment chooses to control what he eats. He chooses what is going to be put in him. And I think that's an important thing to recognise for us. That amidst a lot of the circumstances we may find ourselves in, we can control what we take in. From a physical perspective, we control what we eat, right? We, we have a choice as to what we're going to eat. And I recognise this, we're in a, a, a cost of living crisis, so maybe those choices are feeling more limited in this time. But actually, the grand scheme of things, we choose what we eat. But beyond, bigger than that, we, we choose what we take in. You can choose what you see. You can choose what you hear and listen to. You choose what you choose to watch on your phone and see in your life. You choose the voices that get to speak into you. You may not be able to control some of the external circumstances in your life, but you can control what you take in from it. I was thinking of phone. You don't have to be a genius on your phone to know that the algorithms on our social media feeds basically work in a way that you watch something and then the, the algorithm goes, right, he likes that. I'm going to show him more of that. We control what we see more than we kind of want to be able to control it. So I just encourage you, have a think. What are you taking into your life? What are you listening to? What are you watching? What people's voices are speaking over you and impacting you? You can control that. You can control the things that you take into your life. Right, let's move on with the story, shall we? So after this training, the king tests them. He tests Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and Daniel and he tests them. And it says of this in the test in Daniel 1.20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king mentioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So here they come to this test and they massively excel. I've got the question here, was, was this God in control here, making them pass this test? Or is this them in control here of being really good at what's being asked of them? The clue to the answer to this comes in Daniel 1 verse 17, where it says this. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. So here we see this really unique and amazing dynamic at play here. It says here, God gave them knowledge and understanding. So when we say, is God in control here? Yes, God's in control here. God gave them this knowledge and this understanding. But also we see something else at play. Because it says, God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature. And God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of learning. Learning. So actually... That's the, the activity of learning was them having to learn as well. So we can say, was God in control? Yeah, he gave them knowledge and understanding. Were they in control? Yeah, because they did the learning. And this is a, a typical example of how God works throughout scripture and also how God works in our lives today. He works in this sort of dual project mentality, which is amazing because it's, it's God going, here you go, here's the provision, here's the kind of the start. And then we then go, great, and we then run with it. It started right back in creation where God goes, here, I'm going to create you, I'm going to create the animals, and now you come and rule. You come and rule here. You see, God works like that all the time. He is in control and he gives us control. He is there and we are there working together. So let's carry on with the story. We then get into the second chapter of Daniel. And this one tends to focus a little bit more on Daniel because what happens is the king Nebuchadnezzar has a dream one night and the king can't sleep and he's troubled by this dream and he wants to know what this dream means. And he brings people to him and he says, right, I want you to tell me what this dream means. His magicians come and his enchanters come and his kind of astrologers come. And they're saying, we can't possibly do this. We don't know what it means. But he makes it harder on them because he actually says, not only do I want you to tell me what this dream means, but I want you to tell me what the dream actually was in the first place. So they don't even know what the dream is about, but the king Nebuchadnezzar is saying to them, you need to tell me what the dream is and what it means. So everyone's freaking out at this point because nobody knows what the dream's about. And Daniel then comes and it says, give me some time. So the king says, okay. So 
Daniel then goes to his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and they seek God together for what this dream is and what it might mean. And what's amazing is that God then reveals the dream to Daniel. Imagine that. Not having a clue about what this dream was. And then God goes, that's what the dream is. And God, Daniel then goes and tells him. Now this reminds me of something else when we're talking about control and things outside of our control. And that is to say that the revelation of God is totally outside of our control. We cannot control when and how and in what he, God will say to us. We can't control it. We, I'd love to be able to, to stand here or stand in front of uh, a church congregation and say, right, if you do this, if you pray this, if you read this, if you do this, then God will reveal himself in this way to you at this time and everything's going to be amazing. I can't do that because it's simply not the truth. The revelation of God is totally outside of our control. There is no way that Daniel will have known that dream unless God had told him it and God decided to tell him it. It says in Psalm 135 verse 6, the Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. Sometimes I wonder that we we try and get God and, and, and reduce him down to, to some kind of uh, smaller being in which we can demand things of him at certain times and we ask that he will do stuff at certain times in our ways. But God is far bigger than that. He's far bigger than us. And he chooses when and how he reveals himself. So Daniel reveals the dream to the king, right? And listen to what happens. The, the king in response to hearing what the dream was and hearing the uh, interpretation of the dream, he falls face down in front of Daniel. Falls on his face and he's lying out in front of Daniel and he honours Daniel and he showers Daniel with gifts and with praise and all sorts of stuff. If you think about it, that's mad because here's Daniel who... In, in the sight of the king is, is, is nothing. He's purely an exile of some nation that the Babylonian Empire have invaded. And here he is, the king is face down in front of him. The king says this to Daniel in 2.47, Daniel 2.47, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. I try and put myself in the in the shoes of Daniel at this point, I think what must have been going through his mind as the king of the Babylonian empire is on his face in front of him? What, what, what is he thinking? He's like, this is amazing. Everything's going to change now, right? Surely this, God, this guy, this king who realises that God is God, is, everything's going to change. The world's going to be different. We're going to be able to go back to Israel. Everything's going to be amazing now. I bet he must have been so surprised by Nebuchadnezzar's reaction to this as well. And it reminds me of something else that is outside of our control. Uh, and that is people. People are outside of our control. Other people are outside of our control. We cannot control the way that people will respond to something we bring them. He must have been so surprised seeing Nebuchadnezzar lying there on the floor, right? And he must have been like, this, I didn't imagine this at all. And here he is, face down on the floor. But he realises that we can't control these things. Because Daniel must have hoped that this might have been a changing point. But as we come on it to it a bit later, we realise that Nebuchadnezzar hasn't changed. We realise that actually not only can we not control people's responses, but we can't control other people's spiritual growth. We can't control other people's responses to God and his revelation. See, we can't control our friends and our family members' behaviour. We can't control, I'm thinking of the people I know who are in my life who don't know Jesus yet. I can't control them. I can't say they're going to become a Christian now. They're going to know Jesus right now. They're going to do this and everything's going to be changed. We can't control that. We can't control whether they will come to know Jesus or not. We can, can ask though. We can seek God for his revelation and we can ask God that he will change the hearts and minds of, of people in our lives. But we can't 
And actually, we shouldn't seek to control anyone. The minute we start to try to control anybody else, we are, we are breaking the, the, the norm of what God wants for our relationships with other human beings. We're not called to control one another. We're control, called, called to love one another, to draw alongside one another and work together. We are not, control, we are not called to control each other. Let's carry on with the story, shall we? The king then placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Here's something else we can learn about control in this story. We cannot control other people. We we cannot determine their next steps. We cannot do these things. But something we see here that Daniel does here is as he requests to the king that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego get a promotion, we realise that we can have influence for the good of other people. We can't control other people, but we can influence. We can help lead. We can help encourage and help steer people in the right direction in their lives by by either being their ambassador for them, by standing up and speaking for them when they feel like they have no voice, or whether we're helping them more specifically and directly. We can have influence over other people. So it gets me thinking about Christmas, right? And those people that maybe you'd love in in your life to come to know Jesus. We can't control whether they'll come to know Jesus or not. We can't control what their behaviour will be. But we can influence. When you've got people in your house around Christmas, you can be an influence for God's kingdom there. You can be a beacon of light to people. You can invite people to the Christmas events and then see if God will reveal himself in that moment. We can't control, but we can have an impact. Right, let's carry on, shall we? Because the next step of the next scene in this story is King Nebuchadnezzar builds himself this massive statue, massive gold statue. And he says to the, all the people in the Babylonian Empire, right, everybody, when you hear music, you have to bow down and worship this statue. Some of his court officials come to him and they say, hey, they probably don't say hey to the king, do they? But he says, your majesty, there are some Jews who aren't bowing down. And so before you know it, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are brought before King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar then gives them one more chance. He says, you need to bow down to this statue. Otherwise, you'll be thrown into a furnace. However, they refuse. And we read in Daniel 3 now from verse 16, their response. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown in the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. The point here that's firstly to remind us we can't control the revelation of God. They had no idea what was going to happen if they were going to be thrown in that furnace, right? We had no idea if they had no idea if they were going to die or survive or whatever. But we can control our response to his intervention. We can control our response to God's intervention or his seeming lack of intervention in our lives. They use this phrase, but even if he does not... Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in this moment are in control of their response to the situation. They can't control others, lots of their external circumstances outside of their realm of control, but they can control their response. It reminds me of Jesus and the way he led this, because actually even as he was fully God and fully man and lived here on the earth, he had this dynamic of control in his life. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was arrested, he was on his knees and he says there, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, because he recognised what he was about to go through. But then he says, but not my will, but your will be done. 
In that moment, Jesus recognised that this was something that was outside of his control and he couldn't necessarily control the circumstances that were coming up from, a, from an earthly, you know, humanly perspective. But he could control his response. He can control his response to God by saying, but your will be done. See, there are other times in his life where he said, actually, my time has not yet come. And another time where he says, I only do what I see my father doing. There is a sense that he is um, willing to be under the control of God's sovereignty, whilst recognising that there are things that God has given him to do as well. It's an amazing response of Jesus. See, this story continues. After Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to bow down to this statue, this is what happens. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men tied up? and threw into the fire. They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, come out of the fire. And satraps and prefects, governors and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. What a moment. Many people would, uh, theologians would call this a Christophany, which is basically like a, a showing or a manifestation of Jesus in the Old Testament. As Nebuchadnezzar points to him and says, he looks like the son of the gods. It's uh, Jonathan Edwards, a theologian, says, and the prophet Daniel in the historical part of his book gives an account of a very remarkable appearance of Christ in Nebuchadnezzar's furnace with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. As I said, we can't control the revelation of God. We can't control when Jesus will come and reveal himself to, to us, to his friends. We can't control what that will look like and how he will do it and when he will do it. But let me tell you, when he does do it, it changes everything. He, he brings such a presence that means that people can stand in a fire and not be burned. You may know a little bit of my story from this year. Uh, my wife Heather and I uh, sadly lost a baby. Our baby Theo was born uh, sleeping in April of this year. And it's been an incredibly sad time for us. And uh, we've had to handle things and go through that grief and still are. But something we have encountered is the love and the presence of God so with us. Not in this dramatic flames around us, burning fire and that kind of sense, but this sense of, of, of peace, this sense of uh, just tranquility, this, this sense of God's comfort and his kindness to us has just meant that we can cope with the days. It's meant that we're able to get out of bed. It's, it's meant that we've just felt peace when really we, we shouldn't have. And we look back at the events of this year and... and if we could change them, of course we would change them. In a heartbeat, I would bring that little boy back to life. But reasonably quickly, we realised we can't control these circumstances. We'd love to be in control of our lives, right? We'd love to be able to jump through every hoop when we want to do it and the next thing happens, the next thing happens, but we cannot control things in our lives like that. But what we can control and what Heather and I have been trying to to step in on a day-by-day -day basis is we're trying to control our response. We're making choices about how are we going to react to the things around us? How are we going to deal with this? We're going to control the fact that we can seek God, that we can ask him for his revelation. We can ask him for his presence. And by his beautiful kindness and his grace, he has provided himself to us. You see, circumstances come and circumstances change. Roles in your life can come and go. Jobs can come and go. Redundancies come. 
Promotions may come or not come. People may come into your life and then leave. Friendships may come and you feel like they may be forever and they may crumble. There's so many things in our lives that seem so out of our control. And there are things in our lives that are out of our control. We can have an influence, right? We can pray. We can ask questions of God. We can come to him on a day-by-day basis and every time we remember we can influence and encourage others to come to know him. We can, we can invite them to things. We can invite them into God's presence. We can invite them into conversations of faith. We can be caring. We can choose to love. We can choose to empathise and sympathise with others. But we can't control them. We can't control the reaction of others. We can't control the way that others will behave or speak or act around us or to us. But we can control our posture. We can control our spiritual posture, our response to God, our response to the circumstances in our lives, the position that we take. We can control that. So whether you're thinking about this month and all that Christmas brings and the busyness and the craziness and you're trying to figure out what these circumstances are going to be like and what can I control and that dark, chaotic cloud that might want to loom over us. Or maybe you're thinking big picture what your future might look like. May you know that God will do whatever he pleases. As as hard as that can be to accept and as, as painful at times as that is, may there be great comfort from him as well. May you have comfort actually that because things are outside of your control, there is somebody far greater who is in control. And through him, all things work for the good of those who love him. And let's remember that there are some things within our control. I'm not going to get much peace this Christmas. I've got two kids, a big loud dog. I've got lots going on. But I can control a 15 minute bit of my morning where I buy one of those advent candles and I light it and I sit there in peace. May you find just small things, momentary things in your day that you feel that you can control. You may know the prayer of serenity that many people pray daily across the world. The beginning of it, and I'll leave you with this, this bit of prayer. The beginning of it says this, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Amen.